I was asked by Pastor Fries to talk about polyphonic chant. And I was just musing and pondering on what, what am I going to say? I mean, you just do it. You know, it's just, it's like singing in four part harmony. You just do it. But then I got to thinking, well, there are some things I could say about how that is done. This arose out of uh, the, um, our choir's use for quite a long time of the books that are out of print uh, that were put together by Walter Bazin. Um, the Concordia Liturgical Series for Church Choirs that he edited, two books in 1942 and 1944, one of the introits and the other of the graduals. And they're just golden because uh, they're beautiful. And they were written, and Walter Bazin wrote them um, when he was an influential member of the Synod's Commission on Worship liturgics and hymnology, which he had been for, which he was actually from 1940 until 1967. That's important as a bit of information about Walter Bazin because it means that those settings for the introits and propers, which we still use in our church, which we've used in our church for years, in fact they were used uh, before I arrived, well they fell out of use and they came back into use when I came there. Um, the, some of the older members of St. Paul's still remember when their choir director used those settings back in the day. Those settings were written, were, were framed in order to match the settings of, that we find in the Lutheran hymnal. And if you happen to be in a congregation that uses them, you can hear that for yourself. The, the harmonics and the, the hymnic arrangements kind of go together. You know, you have, for example, the introit, and then you go right into the Kyrie, and it just kind of provides a seamless sort of a match. And so the fact that these were out of print forced us to do a little <laughs> And so I, you know, I kind of felt bad about that. So it, it, took, it took me a while, so I finally put it all together. And what, what you have here, is the Bazine settings in one book. And there they are. It's, for, it's not for every day, it's for every Sunday and the feast days. You've got the intro and the gradual and the, and the uh, Bazine settings. Um, and it's, it's been helpful for our choir. The only thing that's not helpful is says about 101 typos, which means you know it's about 98% accurate. <laughs> that's one of the things we have to put up with. Um, anyway. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to say that whether you use these settings or not, I think that the pastors of the church need to take very seriously the role of musician. And I don't think we ought to settle for pastors simply saying, I'm not a musician. I can't sing. I don't know anything about music. Now there's a rumor and I half believe it, that the Orthodox, speaking of the Orthodox, used to require that men entering their seminaries would have rich baritone voices. I think there ought to be some sort of requirement, or at least encouragement, on the part of Lutheran seminaries in that direction, at least. I mean, after all, Blessed Martin Luther used to say that next to word of God, the Word of God, Rush Limbaugh is the most important thing. <laughs> music, music is the most important thing. We lost that. And I think we lost it in the middle of the 20th century. I heard another rumor that the reason the musical settings for the pastor were not provided in the Lutheran hymnal was that there was a bit of a paper shortage during the war and it was assumed that the pastors would know what to sing. Whatever, whether or not that's true, the fact that the musical settings were not provided in the hymnal has resulted in pastors speaking their part and the congregation singing its part. And that, from there began the woeful decline of um, musical aptitude among pastors in our churches. And pastors started to think and generations after those pastors started to think it was perfectly acceptable not to sing at all. And what you 
began to get was services that were, quite frankly, boring. And I'll just say it. You have to just, you know, slodge through them. And that's not the way the Word of God is meant to be used. It's meant to be sung. I, I firmly believe that in the Garden of Eden, when Eve was created, Adam's first words, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. After all, that's kind of a poem. I believe he's saying those words. I believe that the word of man was first sung. And certainly our best efforts at relaying to one another and back to God words would be the best we can offer, which would be melodically. So it seems to me that the history of the church is correct in showing that chant is always going to be preferable to simply speaking. Now, I'm not going to go through the details about the history of Gregorian music and how it's led to polyphonic music in the present day, but I will say a few things about that. Um, now, Dr. Bazin insisted as is common among liturgical scholars, that Gregorian music is always supposed to be sung in unison, that is, monophonically, um, as we did it in our noonday prayers and as we'll be doing it in Vespers and so forth. In fact, what you have, what uh, um, Dr. Mays and uh, Pastor Fries have provided for us in English, which comes over from the German, also comes from the Gregorian era. Those, those nooms and those staves that you have are Gregorian um, formulations. They go back to about the, six, the year 600. And before that, who knows? But at least it was from that time that it began to get codified. And you got the, the eight standard psalm tones in addition to which there's a, a foreign tone. Um, and so from that point, you can sort of trace the, the use in standard, standardized forms of, of music in monosyllabic forms. And then in about, at about the turn of the millennium and in that period coming up to about 12 and 1300, you started to get very gradually um, two alterations uh, coming on the scene, one of which was um, something that um, uh, that Willie Apel calls word painting. Willie Apel uh, wrote a book that's about this thick called A Gregorian Chant, published by the U Indiana U University Press. If you really want to know a lot about Gregorian Chant, or, have, or if you really want to know how little you know about it, try reading that book. <laughs> um, and he points out that originally, and still today, I think you can show this in the, uh, the, the notations that you have provided, there is no word painting in that kind of, um, kind of notation. Word painting would tie the meaning of the words to the notes, um, not just to emphasize the proper syllable, but to uh, enhance the meaning, so to speak, so that if you have a good example of no word painting, you can attach any one of the eight psalm tones to any psalm, and it won't make any difference. That's what was originally in use when there was, when Gregorian chant was first um, be, begun to be codified. There was no word painting. Well, that obviously changed, and has been changing over those hundreds and hundreds of years, in addition to which you started to get polyphony. Polyphony, po polyphony being more than one line of music going at the same time. In other words, harmonization. And it resulted, finally, in uh, the great harmonizations, which we have uh, in the days of the Reformation. In the Lutheran Church, of course, we have, we have uh, harmonizations which are still considered second to none. And finally, you get to the, the apex, I think, of all musical aptitude, sacred musical aptitude, with the coming of Johann Sebastian Bach. And I think that that, if anything, the rising of Bach and what he did with sacred music is 
sort of the coup de grace against the idea that you shouldn't have polys, um, polyphonic chant, polyphonic music, or word painting. Um, those are nice things, and I don't argue with you guys. I think that's beautiful. But we would not say that that's the only thing you can have, because after all, we love Bach. And, <laughs> and so I think that argument kind of lets itself stand, speaks for itself. Um, the beauty of polyphonic sacred music has clearly been established, and whatever early churchmen there were who were opposed to it have been drowned out, never to be heard from again. Uh, but alas, since sometime between the 1960s and now, uh, the choral settings, as I said, went out of print. And I think they probably did because not enough choirs were liturgically trained. And I think that what has happened is that those, uh, the fact that there were, we, we lost the interest in music and in, in the pastors leading the way in singing, the choirs didn't know what to do. So they started becoming the kinds of choirs that you're probably more accustomed to in our day, and that is that you have, you know, you have your two or three readings, and it's usually, I think, in between the second and the third that you get, now we're going to hear from our choir, you're going to have an anthem, and the choir will sing a wonderful rendition of In the Garden or whatever. <laughs> right. And in fact, the choir might even be stationed kind of up in the front. This is, this is typical. Baptist things where you got the choir behind the preacher. I, I was raised in a church like this. It wasn't a Baptist church, it was a Reformed church where the, the choir loft was behind the pulpit. And everybody could see the choir. We wore robes, but so what? You could see us. And you could also see the kids when they sang too because that was the, they were showcasing themselves as we're gonna do a number now. And we still have that. We're stuck with that in our churches. And I would submit to you the part of the reason for that is that the pastors have lost the lead when it comes to singing. So if I can impress upon you one thing, it would be the importance of beginning to strive toward insisting that all of our pastors learn music and learn to sing. Now I'm, today I'm afraid I'm the ultimate hypocrite because, you know, I... It's not just today. <laughs> <laughs> here, I sit, here I stand, and we're, we're singing during mass, you know, and I can't sing today. I couldn't sing yesterday either. I had to, I had to speak the mass yesterday. That's purgatory for me. Um, I, I had to sing like most of the men in your churches do. <laughs> if you listen very carefully, they are singing the notes. It's just that it's a whole octave lower. And sometimes, you know, those notes get really low and they can reach a low C. They can do it if you listen carefully. That's what I was doing today. I felt like an idiot. <laughs> Not just Usually me. I am an idiot, <laughs> but I felt like an idiot. <laughs> So I also believe that there are very few people in the world who are actually tone deaf. I think maybe John Pless and two or three other people. <laughs> That's it. If, if you think you're tone deaf, if you think you're tone deaf, and you can follow my note. If I go, Rup, and you follow that, you do that, you're not tone deaf. You're just not trained. And for the longest time, now I have no idea, and we have some people representing the seminary here today. Maybe you can tell me that more is being, hopefully you can tell me that more is being done in this way today. But when I was there, we had woefully little attention given to singing. I mean, we had the cantorai, we had the scola cantorum and so forth, but those were all optional. I think music should be required. I think that seminarians should be made to sing. When I was living up in Wisconsin, I directed the children's choir. I have a little time to tell this story. 
And the kids were petrified of me because I made them do stuff that they didn't want to do. Now, I happen to know the story of um, David Wilcox um, and how he would have the, uh, the King's College Choir, the boys' choir, do the, the once, in David, once in Royal David City. Have you ever heard that, you know, where it starts with the, the single solo, the single boy singing, once in David, you know, that, that one, the sing, one boy, boy singing that first stanza? Beautiful. The way he would do that, I learned, was by telling the whole choir, now, you boys, one of you is going to sing this solo on the night of the performance, but I'm not going to tell you which one it is until <laughs> two seconds before you do it. So they all had to prepare as though they were going to be the one. And I thought, wow, that's really cool. I'll try it. <laughs> <laughs> and at the beginning, at the beginning of the school year, the kids were terrified. But by the time Christmas rolled around, they were begging me to be the one. And I pulled it off. It's just a matter of raising your bar of expectations. And if it's true for kids, I think it's true for adults, too. We're not too old to learn new tricks. We need to learn. I don't want, I don't want any Lutheran pastors thinking, except maybe this John class, thinking, <laughs> I can't sing. OK, or that I would not be able to learn how to sing. I don't believe you. You can't sing. Fine, you've made your confession. <laughs> You are forgiven. Now go sing. Now go, now go learn to sing. <laughs> um, so I won't say much more except for this. Um, uh, I'm just going to do a little advertising. This, this Lutheran Proper's book, I brought some along here. Um, it comes in two parts, too, for the Pew edition. Um, and there's some, we have some hymns in the back, um, some new hymns, as well as uh, hymns for people that use the Lutheran hymnal and don't use, don't have the LSB, we have the, uh, the notation, the, uh, the words in the back. And then there's this other groundbreaking new book that I think you should get, The New Testament in His Blood, The Study of the Holy Liturgy of the Christian Church. Um, so now, with the remaining minutes, um, you, you, you tweak my interest. Um, I evidently uh, fired a shot across your bow <laughs> in the article I wrote. This is what, this is what I think I wrote. <laughs> here it is, here it is. This is from the article. Okay. This, okay, um, our congregation's choir has been ignoring the advice of Dr. Bazine and singing these chant tones harmonically for years. Um, Charles McLean, if you, all, if you know him, he says the harmonization was only provided for the uh, organ to support the singing. Maybe you know that. Um, Why would but you put that restriction on it? What's that? Why would you put that restriction on it? Yeah. Well, we've been singing it harmonically for years, and it certainly sounds delightful to my ear. In fact, sometimes we've had, during midweek services, we, they're spoken, they're low masses uh, every Wednesday, except once in a while, if it's a, high, if it's a feast day, we'll, we'll sing it. We don't have an organ on Wednesday, we just sing a cappella. And if we have the right people there, sometimes they'll start singing in harmony. And it's gorgeous. So I think, why not? So then I say, this does tend to reduce the accidental character Dr. Bazine relates to the Gregorian sound, and it seems to me makes it more like the Lutheran chorale. With apologies to Dr. Benjamin Mays and Reverend Michael Fries, whose yeoman efforts have done much to bring the beauties of a genuine Gregorian chant into our midst, I, for one, will not quibble over the use of harmonized propers. Einstein's declaration notwithstanding, you yeah, have all people to quote in support of his position. Bazin quotes Einstein. <laughs> the sound is dignified, lovely, and majestic, and in my view, clearly enhances the common service. Um, and it's wonderful if the pastor can come in trained, a little bit at least in music, know how to sing, 
and sort of weasel his way into the choir and replace the garbage that they are singing, of course, winsomely, <laughs> with some liturgical music. And we, we, we regularly, you know, sing a stanza or two of the, of the hymn of the day. And the choir's been doing that now in my church for about 17, 18 years, and it works just fine. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna leave it at that, and you can throw tomatoes or whatever. Are the Bouzine settings, the harmonic settings, are they based on the traditional Gregorian tones? Like, are They're, the melodies? They the claim same? to be, yes. Um, <laughs> whether they are or not, uh, it's, it's hard to say. Um, they're it, it, probably as much as a number of our hymns claim to be based on tone one or tone two. You know, they, they to say it's based on it, it's, it's sort of like saying a, a Hollywood movie is based on a true story. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's based on it, yeah. adapted, but adapted. it's based on it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you'd be able to answer that better than I would. But there's so many variations. So, yeah. are there any other comments or questions or am I done? It, it was a good way to uh, raise some interest in your article. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I don't have anything to, to dis disagree with here. Wonderful. So. Oh, how good and pleasant <laughs> it is. It's <laughs> 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 like the precious light went upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. I wish I could sing that. I would if I could, but I unfortunately today can't. <laughs> we wanted to hear you further on these things. Uh, I was hoping for demonstrations. I was hoping you were going to take one of our psalms and show us how to how to uh, break it into parts. Well, so maybe that's another day when your voice is. Back. That's in the book. It's in the book. Got to buy the book. The whole psalter's not in there, is there? What's that? If you did that, would they're you still, all in here? If you did it, it still wouldn't be word painting. You'd still be able to take that and and sing it to any to any yes. song. Yes. Yeah. These are not word painting. These that is word correct. Painting. They're still they're still kind of universal. Yeah, you can take any tone and apply it. You see, now this one the, says it's tone two. Da, 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 da. And then they provide the harmonization beneath it. Now that one is pretty much straight up. And there's tone four G. Da, 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 da. I mean, there are different variations of that too. So you've got those tone one. You're asking me to do something that's very hard. Tone well, three. There's 64 of these, aren't there? 64. No. But uh, yeah, they're all in here. I think it's it's all it's all meant for four parts. Well, I think Bazin meant it for um, monophonic singing with the organ playing the parts. Okay, but it's but it's four lines. Four lines. It's all yeah, and you can. It's easy to. It's easy for choirs to do. They pick up right up on it. Yeah, it's, our choir had no problem learning them at all. They are not difficult to learn. I don't know. Ronnie's probably not down here. He, he's back, back there somewhere. Here. Well, and when your choir is yeah, fewer in number, go. then you have. Maybe just the soprano and bass, or soprano and yeah. tenor. Yeah, right? well, lately our choir has been rather small. We've lost a number of people because my sons have grown up. Um, <laughs> so what I often do, we'll have we'll have uh, uh, soprano, alto, and tenor. Tenor altering, sometimes singing the bass note, but more often staying on the tenor line. So the organ have, plays quietly with. Yes, but it has not been up until recently. So we do a lot of, the, the propers are, have generally been done up until recent years, a cappella, but we're a little too small now to handle that, so, yeah. Do yeah. you have a music background? It's, um, I mean, I, I kind of resonate with what you're saying about this idea of having more music education in the preparation of the office of ministry. Well, I've dabbled in music, and I almost went into it uh, my fourth year in college, but I had to go another four years to get my baccalaureate degree, and I didn't want to do that. Yeah. So I didn't get a formal degree in it, but I've, I've had training in it. I've taken music theory and so forth, and I would recommend that. Uh -huh. um, at, at the very least, pastors should be taking voice lessons, yeah. and they should maybe have a, have a course or two in music theory. And I they should acquire, and they should have music history. Yeah, that wouldn't hurt. hurt wouldn't hurt at all. I, I think that's woefully lacking, or at least has been woefully lacking in recent years in our training. 
Okay, I guess my time is up. Uh, also, uh, we what, oh, what are we yes. The leader of the congregation, do you have any suggestions or ideas for how a musically trained pastor uh, in a congregation that's lost kind of the ability to be a singing congregation, how that pastor might use that leadership to reintroduce singing of all kinds, liturgy and hymns, into the congregation, or perhaps into a choir for proffers also? Very carefully. <laughs> uh, I mean, you're, at, you're, you're kind of venturing into another area, and that's the area of pastoral practice. You know, how do you implement what you want to do? My, my point is simply putting the, putting the target out there. If this is what you want to achieve, you, I have to convince, we have to convince people first that this is worthy of achieving. And the question you're asking is, how do you get there? And that might take a whole other few hours to discuss. And I may not even have the right answer. But my only purpose now is to put that out there because I think we haven't even had the target in view. <laughs>